Kolkata. Nobody knows how many people are living here. It is estimated that 18 million people live in this maze of dilapidated buildings and decaying infrastructure. It was once the capital of India until it was relocated to New Delhi in 1911. After independence in 1947, many Hindus moved to Kolkata to avoid being part of West Pakistan, the future Bangladesh. These once beautiful buildings are a reminder of a bygone era when India was a British colony. What's still left is their love of cricket, as well as the impressive Victoria Memorial Hall. It was designed to commemorate Queen Victoria's Diamond Jubilee in 1901. The building and its gardens are an island of tranquility in a sea of poverty and decay. Throughout the year, artisans are busy creating statues depicting the goddess Kali, the protector of Kolkata. The sculptures are made out of mud from a nearby contributory of the Ganges. This multi-armed horror figure with bloody tongue and a chain of decapitated heads around a neck is revered as the destroyer. Once a year, huge processions parade down to the river to submit their statues back to the river to become mud again. A continuous circle of life and death. Despite the obvious poverty, one feels a certain vibrancy as well as contentment in this place. Perhaps it is their religious beliefs and their stoical way that gets the people through the life of hardship. As somebody once said, here, life is like a taxi ride. You hop on, you hop off, change to your next life and hope it will be better. An hour's flight took us from Kolkata to Siliguri. The braided riverbeds have become production sites where cobblestones are manually broken down for building gravel. Leaving the hot and humid lowlands behind, we climbed on a winding road through the foothills of the Himalayas with its lush vegetation towards Darjeeling. Not many drivers seem to take these warnings to heart. Darjeeling is world-renowned for its tea. The pickers are mainly Nepali women, earning a paltry 90 rupees, about 1 euro 50 a day for picking 7 kilos of leaves. What a treat to see these beautiful dancers giving an open-air performance. As we approached Darjeeling in the late afternoon, a neon-lit monastery came into sight. A service for someone recently departed was in progress. There is a period of time between death and rebirth called the Bado. 
During this time, the spirit is freed from the body and confused and needs guidance to be enlightened and liberated. British colonial administration set up a military post and a sanatorium in Darjeeling. It was a place for soldiers and civil servants to escape the unhealthy climate and summer heat of the lowlands. Being surrounded by Nepal, Sikkim, Bhutan and Tibet, Darjeeling is a melting pot of different cultures and religions. The main population group are the fiercely independent Gorkhas, who came originally from Nepal. I wonder what that means. An ingenious way to get better traction, especially in winter. Everybody's household seems to have their own water pipeline. Sherpa Tenzing Norgay lived most of his life in Darjeeling, which was, at the time, the starting point of most mountaineering expeditions as Nepal was close to foreigners. His exact birth date is unknown. After conquering Everest with Hillary on the 29th of May 1953, he decided to make this day his birthday. A mountaineering school was established in his honor near his grave. At the nearby zoo, one can see some of the Himalayan fauna. Could the Himalayan bear be the one mistaken for the elusive Yeti? In 1959, when China invaded Tibet and the Dalai Lama fled to India, many Tibetans followed him and set up a refugee center in Darjeeling. Here, as in most monasteries, the sacred art of sculpturing butter is practiced. These sculptures are given as offerings to please the deities. To improve access to Darjeeling, the East Bengal Railway Company built a railway from Siliguri to Darjeeling in 1881. The track was built either near or sometimes even on the road. The Darjeeling Himalayan Railway has to overcome an elevation of about 2,000 meters over a distance of only 88 kilometers. To enable the train to traverse this twisting route through the hills, the line was built to a gauge of 2 feet or 600 millimeters with many switchbacks where the train had to go forward, backward and forward again. Some of the original steam engines are still in operation. In its time, it was an outstanding technological achievement.
Just outside Darjeeling is the Gum Monastery. This is the home of the Jelupa or Yellow Hat School. Although the youngest of the four Buddhist sects, it is the biggest with the Dalai Lama as its head. Despite the bitter cold, we waited patiently to watch the Himalayas at sunrise from the 2,400 meter high Tiger Hill. Just before the sun broke through the haze, the 8,598 meter high Kanchenjunga, the third highest mountain in the world, appeared. What a beautiful sight! On the way down at the Makahal temple, one can observe the Hindu and Buddhist cultures side by side. Buddhist prayer flags and Hindu bells coexist peacefully next to one another. It was time to say goodbye to Darjeeling, but not without a last visit to the Dali Monastery, the headquarter of one of the Tibetan Buddhist sects. A winding road took us through indigenous forests and small villages towards Sikkim. Don't worry, it is not as bad as it looks. The chef produced a remarkable lunch in this primitive kitchen. 
The Tista River marks the border between West Bengal and Sikkim. Sikkim used to be an independent monarchy. Wedged between Tibet, Nepal and Bhutan, it was always a strategic puffer zone between China and India. So it is not surprising that India, using nefarious reasons, annexed Sikkim in 1975. Entry is strictly controlled and only possible by special permit. Due to its hilly topography, the soil and rocks are very susceptible to weathering and erosion. This, combined with heavy rainfalls in the monsoon season, results in frequent landslides. Sikkim is hard at work to improve the tourism infrastructure. Once again, a fantastic sight of the Kanchenjunga at sunrise from our balcony. The head monk of the Pema Yangtze Monastery used to be responsible for the enthronement of the king. In 1959, when the Chinese invaded Tibet, the 16th Kamapa, head of one of the four orders, fled Tibet and found refuge in Sikkim. The king built the Ramtek monastery for him, which became the seat of his sect. The 16th Kamapa must have had a split personality because after his death in 1981, two separate groups claimed to have found different reincarnations. Money, power and intrigue is prevalent even here. Although today almost two-thirds of all people living in Sikkim are Nepali Hindus, Buddhism is still the most prominent and visible religion. With over 250 monasteries, the culture of Sikkim is closely linked to Tibetan Buddhism. Gangtok, the capital of Sikkim, used to be a major stopover on the trade route between India and Tibet. In the evening the town comes to life. Besides flowers made in China, as well as natural ones, there are a large variety of fruit and vegetables available in this huge covered market. For us, it was time to leave Sikkim. Roads are being upgraded everywhere. One can only hope that the scars will eventually disappear.
This bridge was built to commemorate the coronation of King George VI and Queen Elizabeth in 1937. Two fairly tame Bengal tigers are supposed to guard the bridge. Back in West Bengal, the villagers are preparing for the Hindu festival of Diwali. We drove through the lowlands with its vast tea plantations towards the foothills of the Himalayas and our next destination, Bhutan. And we had to say goodbye to our Sikkim drivers and guide.